Section 1 of The Scarlet Plague. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. The Scarlet Plague by Jack London. Section 1. The way led along upon what had once been the embankment of a railroad, but no train had run upon it for many years. The forest on either side swelled up the slopes of the embankment and crested across it in a green wave of trees and bushes. The trail was as narrow as a man's body and was no more than a wild animal runway. Occasionally, a piece of rusty iron, showing through the forest mold, advertised that the rail and the ties still remained. In one place, a ten-inch tree, bursting through a connection, had lifted the end of the rail clearly into view. The tie had evidently followed the rail, held to it by the spike long enough for its bed to be filled with gravel and rotten leaves, so that now the crumbling rotten timber thrust itself at a curious slant. Old as the road was, it was manifest that it had been of the monorail type. An old man and a boy traveled along this runway. They moved slowly, for the old man was very old. A touch of palsy made his movements tremulous, and he leaned heavily upon his staff. A rude skull-cap of goatskin protected his head from the sun. From beneath this fell a scant fringe of stained and dirty white hair. A visor, ingeniously made from a large leaf, shielded his eyes, and from under this he peered at the way of his feet on the trail. His beard, which should have been snow-white, but which showed the same weather-wear and camp stain as his hair, fell nearly to his waist in a great tangled mass. About his chest and shoulders hung a single mangy garment of goatskin. His arms and legs, withered and skinny, betokened extreme age as well as did their sunburn and scars and scratches betoken long years of exposure to the elements. The boy, who led the way, checking the eagerness of his muscles to the slow progress of the elder, likewise wore a single garment, a ragged-edged piece of bear skin, with a hole in the middle through which he had thrust his head. He could not have been more than twelve years old. Tucked coquettishly over one ear was the freshly severed tail of a pig. In one hand he carried a medium-sized bow and arrow. On his back was a quiver full of arrows. From a sheath hanging about his neck on a thong projected the battered handle of a hunting knife. He was as brown as a berry, and walked softly, with almost a cat-like tread. In marked contrast with his sunburned skin were his eyes, blue, deep blue, but keen and sharp as a pair of gimlets. They seemed to bore into all about him in a way that was habitual. As he went along he smelled things as well his descended, quivering nostrils carrying to his brain an endless series of messages from the outside world. Also his hearing was acute, and had been so trained that it operated automatically. Without conscious effort he heard all the slight sounds in the apparent quiet, heard and differentiated, and classified these sounds, whether they were of the wind rustling the leaves, of the humming of bees and gnats, of the distant rumble of the sea that drifted to him only in lulls, or of the gopher just under his foot shoving a pouch full of earth into the entrance of his hole. Suddenly he became alertly tense. Sound, sight, and odor had given him a simultaneous warning. His hand went back to the old man, touching him, and the pair stood still. Ahead, at one side of the top of the embankment, arose a crackling sound, and the boy's gaze was fixed on the tops of the agitated bushes. Then a large bear, a grizzly, crashed into view, and likewise stopped abruptly at the sight of the humans. He did not like them, and growled querulously. Slowly the boy fitted the arrow to the bow, and slowly he pulled the bowstring taut. But he never removed his eyes from the bear. The old man peered from under his green leaf at the danger, and stood as quietly as the boy. For a few seconds his mutual scrutinizing went on. Then, the bear betraying a growing irritability, the boy, with a movement of his head, indicated that the old man must step aside from the trail and go down the embankment. The boy followed, going backward, still holding the bow taut and ready. They waited till a crashing among the bushes from the opposite side of the embankment told him the bear had gone on. The boy grinned as he led back to the trail. A big un, Grancer, he chuckled. The old man shook his head. They get thicker every day, he complained in a thin, undependable falsetto. Who'd have thought I'd live to see the time when a man would be afraid of his life on the way to the cliff house? When I was a boy, Edwin, Men and women and little babies used to come out here from San Francisco by tens of thousands on a nice day. 
and there weren't any bears back then, no sir. They used to pay money to look at them in cages. They were that rare. What is money, Grancer? Before the old man could answer, the boy recollected and triumphantly shoved his hand into a pouch under his bearskin and pulled forth a battered and tarnished silver dollar. The old man's eyes glistened as he held the coin close to them. I can't see, he muttered. You look and see if you can make out the date, Edwin. The boy laughed. You're a great grancer, he cried delightedly, always making believe them little marks mean something. The old man manifested an accustomed chagrin as he brought the coin back again close to his own eyes. Two thousand twelve, he shrilled, and then fell to cackling grotesquely. That was the year Morgan V was appointed President of the United States by the Board of Magnates. It must have been one of the last coins minted, for the Scarlet Death came in 2013. Lord, Lord, think of it! Sixty years ago, and I am the only person alive today that lived in those times. Where did you find it, Edwin? The boy, who had been regarding him with a tolerant curiousness one accords to the prattlings of the feeble-minded, answered promptly, I got it off of Hoo Hoo. He found it when we was herding goats down near San Jose last spring. Hoo Hoo said it was money. Ain't you hungry, Grancer? The ancient caught his staff in a tighter grip and urged along the trail, his old eyes shining greedily. I hope Hare Lip has found a crab or two, he mumbled. They're good eating crabs, mighty good eating when you've got no more teeth, and you've got grandsons that love their old grandsire and make a point of catching crabs for him. When I was a boy, but Edwin, suddenly stopped by what he saw, was drawing the bowstring on a fitted arrow. He paused on the brink of a crevasse in the embankment, an ancient culvert had here washed out, and the stream, no longer confined, had cut a passage through the fill. On the opposite side, the end of a rail projected and overhung. It showed rustily through the creeping vines which overran it. Beyond, crouching by a bush, a rabbit looked across at him in trembling hesitancy. Fully fifty feet was the distance, but the arrow flashed true and the transfixed rabbit, crying out in a sudden fright and hurt, struggled painfully away into the brush. The boy himself was a flash of brown skin and flying fur, as he bounced down the steep wall of the gap, and up the other side. His lean muscles were springs of steel that released into graceful and efficient action. A hundred feet beyond, in a tangle of bushes, he overtook the wounded creature, knocked its head on a convenient tree trunk, and turned it over to Grancer to carry. Rabbit is good, very good the ancient quavered, but when it comes to a toothsome delicacy, I prefer crab. When I was a boy, why do you have to say so much that ain't got no sense? Edwin impatiently interrupted the other's threatened garrulousness. The boy did not exactly utter these words, but something that remotely resembled them, and that was more guttural and explosive and economical of qualifying phrases. His speech showed distant kinship with that of the old man, and the latter's speech was approximately in English that had gone through a bath of corrupt usage. What I want to know, Edwin continued, is why you call crab toothsome delicacy. Crab is crab, ain't it? No one I ever heard calls it such funny things. The old man sighed but did not answer, and they moved on in silence. The surf grew suddenly louder as they emerged from the forest onto a stretch of sand dunes bordering the sea. A few goats were browsing among the sandy hillocks, and a skin-clad boy, aided by a wolfish-looking dog that was only faintly reminiscent of a collie, was watching them. Mingled with the roar of the surf was a continuous deep-throated barking or bellowing, which came from a cluster of jagged rocks a hundred yards out from shore. Here huge sea lions hauled themselves up to lie in the sun or battle with one another. In the immediate foreground arose the smoke of a fire, tended by a third savage-looking boy. Crouched near him were several wolfish dogs similar to the one that guarded the goats. The old man accelerated his pace, sniffing eagerly as he neared the fire. Muscles! he muttered ecstatically. Muscles! Ain't that a crab, hoo-hoo? Ain't that a crab? My, my, you boys are good to your old grandsire. Hoo-hoo, who was apparently of the same age as Edwin, grinned. All you want, grandsir. I got four. The old man's palsied eagerness was pitiful. Sitting down in the sand as quickly as his stiff limbs would let him, he poked a large rock muscle from out of the coals. The heat had forced its shells apart, and the meat, salmon-colored, was thoroughly cooked. Between thumb and forefinger, in trembling haste, he caught the morsel and carried it to his mouth. But it was too hot, and the next moment was violently ejected. The old man spluttered with pain, and tears ran out of his eyes and down his cheeks. The boys were true savages, possessing only the cruel humor of the savage. 
To them, the incident was excruciatingly funny, and they burst into loud laughter. Hoo-Hoo danced up and down, while Edwin rolled gleefully on the ground. The boy with the goats came running in to join in the fun. Set him to cool, Edwin, set him to cool, the old man besought, in the midst of his grief, making no attempt to wipe away the tears that still flowed from his eyes. And cool a crab, Edwin, too. You know your grandsire likes crabs. From the coals arose a great sizzling, which proceeded from the many mussels bursting open their shells and exuding their moisture. They were large shellfish, running from three to six inches in length. The boys raked them out with sticks and placed them on a large piece of driftwood to cool. When I was a boy, we did not laugh at our elders. We respected them. The boys took no notice, and Grancer continued to babble an incoherent flow of complaint and censure. But this time he was more careful and did not burn his mouth. All began to eat, using nothing but their hands and making loud mouth noises and lip smackings. The third boy, who was called Harelip, slyly deposited a pinch of sand on a mussel the ancient was carrying to his mouth, and when the grit of it bit into the old man's mucous membrane and gums, the laughter was again uproarious. He was unaware that a joke had been played on him, and sputtered and spat until Edwin, relenting, gave him a gourd of fresh water with which to wash out his mouth. "'Where's them crabs, hoo-hoo?' Edwin demanded. "'Grancer's set upon having a snack.' Again Grancer's eyes burned with greediness as a large crab was handed to him. It was a shell with legs and all complete, but the meat had long since departed. With shaky fingers and babblings of anticipation, the old man broke off a leg and found it filled with emptiness. "'The crabs, hoo-hoo,' he wailed. "'The crabs?' "'I was fooling, Grancer. They ain't no crabs. I never found one.' The boys were overwhelmed with delight at the sight of the tears of senile disappointment that dribbled down the old man's cheeks. Then, unnoticed, Hoo-Hoo replaced the empty shell with a fresh-cooked crab. Already dismembered, from the cracked legs the white meat sent forth a small cloud of savory steam. This attracted the old man's nostrils, and he looked down in amazement. The change of his mood to one of joy was immediate. He snuffled and muttered and mumbled, making almost a croon of delight as he began to eat. Of this the boys took little notice, for it was an accustomed spectacle, nor did they notice his occasional exclamations and utterance of phrases which meant nothing to them, as, for instance, when he smacked his lips and champed his gums while muttering, mayonnaise, just think, mayonnaise, and it's sixty years since the last was ever made, two generations, and never a smell of it. Why, in those days, it was served in every restaurant with crab. When he could eat no more, the old man sighed, wiped his hands on his naked legs, and gazed out over the sea. With the content of a full stomach, he waxed reminiscent. To think of it, I've seen this beach alive with men, women, and children on a pleasant Sunday, and there weren't any bears to eat them up either. And right there on the cliff was a big restaurant where you could get anything you wanted to eat. Four million people lived in San Francisco then, and now, in the whole city and country, there aren't forty all told. And out there on the sea were ships, and ships always to be seen, going in for the Golden Gate or coming out, and airships in the air, dirigibles and flying machines. They could travel two hundred miles an hour. The mail contract with the New York and San Francisco Limited demanded that for the minimum. There was a chap, a Frenchman, I forget his name, who succeeded in making three hundred, but the thing was risky, too risky for conservative persons. But he was on the right clue, and he would have managed it if it hadn't been for the Great Plague. When I was a boy, there were men alive who remembered the coming of the first aeroplanes, and now I have lived to see the last of them, and that sixty years ago. The old man babbled on, unheeded by the boys, who were long accustomed to his garrulousness, and whose vocabularies besides lacked the greater portion of the words he used. It was noticeable that in these rambling soliloquies his English seemed to recrudesce into better construction and phraseology, but when he talked directly with the boys it lapsed largely into their own uncouth and simpler forms. But there weren't many crabs in those days, the old man wandered on. They were fished out, and they were great delicacies. The open season was only a month long, too, and now crabs are accessible the whole year round. Think of it, catching all the crabs you want, any time you want, in the surf of the Cliff House beach. A sudden commotion among the goats brought the boys to their feet. The dogs about the fire rushed to join their snarling fellows who guarded the goats, 
while the goats themselves stampeded in the direction of their human protectors. A half-dozen forms, lean and gray, glided about on the sand hillocks and faced the bristling dogs. Edwin arched an arrow that fell short. But Harelip, with a sling such as David carried into battle against Goliath, hurled a stone through the air that whistled from the speed of its flight. It fell squarely among the wolves, and caused them to slink away towards the dark depths of the eucalyptus forest. The boys laughed and lay down again in the sand, while Grancer sighed ponderously. He had eaten too much, and with hands clasped on his paunch, his fingers interlaced, he resumed his maunderings. The fleeting systems lapsed like foam, he mumbled what was evidently a quotation. That's it, foam and fleeting. All man's toil upon the planet was just so much foam. He domesticated the serviceable animals, destroyed the hostile ones, and cleared the land of its wild vegetation. And then he passed, and the flood of primordial life rolled back again, sweeping his handiwork away. The weeds and forest inundated his fields, and beasts of prey swept over his flocks. And now there are wolves on the Cliff House beach. He was appalled by the thought. Where four million people disported themselves, the wild wolves roam today, and the savage progeny of our loins, with prehistoric weapons, defend themselves against the fanged despoilers. Think of it, and all because of the Scarlet Death. The adjective had caught Herr Lip's ear. He's always saying that, he said to Edwin. What is Scarlet? The scarlet of the maples can shake me like the cry of bugles going by, the old man quoted. It's red, Edwin answered the question, and you don't know it because you come from the chauffeur tribe. They never did know nothing, none of them. Scarlet is red. I know that. Red is red, ain't it? Harelip grumbled. Then what's the good of getting cocky and calling it scarlet? Grancer, what for do you always say so much what nobody knows, he asked. Scarlet ain't nothing, but red is red. Why don't you say red, then? Red is not the right word, was the reply. The plague was scarlet. The whole face and body turned scarlet in an hour's time. Don't I know? Didn't I see enough of it? And I am telling you it was scarlet, because, well, it was scarlet. There is no other word for it. Red is good enough for me, Harlot muttered obstinately. My dad calls red red, and he ought to know. He says everybody died of the red death. Your dad is a common fellow, descended from a common fellow, Grancer retorted heatedly. Don't I know the beginnings of the chauffeurs? Your grandsire was a chauffeur, a servant, and without education. He worked for other persons. But your grandmother was of good stock, only the children did not take after her. Don't I remember when I first met them, catching fish at Lake Temescal? What is education? Edwin asked. Calling red scarlet, Harelip sneered then returned to the attack on Grancer. My dad told me, and he got it from his dad before he croaked, that your wife was a Santa Rosan, and that she sure was no account. He says she was a hash-slinger before the Red Death, though I don't know what a hash-slinger is. You can tell me, Edwin. But Edwin shook his head in token of ignorance. It is true she was a waitress, Grancer acknowledged. But she was a good woman, and your mother was her daughter. Women were very scarce in the days after the plague. She was the only wife I could find, even if she was a hash-slinger, as your father calls it. But it is not nice to talk about our progenitors that way. Dad says that the wife of the first chauffeur was a lady. What's a lady? Hoo-hoo demanded. A lady's a chauffeur's squaw, was a quick reply of hair lip. The first chauffeur was Bill, a common fellow, as I said before, the old man expounded. But his wife was a lady, a great lady. Before the Scarlet Death she was the wife of Van Warden. He was president of the Board of Industrial Magnates, and was one of the dozen men who ruled America. He was worth one billion eight hundred millions of dollars, coins like you have there in your pouch, Edwin. And then came the Scarlet Death, and his wife became the wife of Bill, the first chauffeur. He used to beat her, too. I have seen it myself. Hoo-hoo, lying on his stomach, and idly digging his toes in the sand, cried out and investigated, first his toenail, and next the small hole he had dug. The other two boys joined him, excavating the sand rapidly with their hands, till there lay three skeletons exposed. Two were of adults, the third being that of a part-grown child. The old man hudged along on the ground and peered at the find. 
Plague victims, he announced. That's the way they died everywhere in the last days. This must have been a family, running away from the contagion and perishing here on the Cliff House beach. They, what are you doing, Edwin? This question was asked in sudden dismay, as Edwin, using the back of his hunting knife, began to knock out the teeth from the jaws of one of the skulls. Gonna string him up, was the response. The three boys were now hard at it, and quite a knocking and hammering arose, in which Grancer babbled on unnoticed. You are true savages. Already has begun the custom of wearing human teeth. In another generation you will be perforating your nose and ears and wearing ornaments of bone and shell. I know. The human race is doomed to sink back farther and farther into the primitive night, ere again it begins its bloody climb upward to civilization. When we increase, and feel the lack of room, we will proceed to kill one another. And then, I suppose you will wear human scalp locks at your waist as well, as you, Edwin, who are the gentlest of my grandsons, have already begun with that vile pigtail. Throw it away, Edwin, boy, throw it away. What a gabble the old geezer makes, Harelip remarked. When the teeth all extracted, they began to attempt at equal division. They were very quick and abrupt in their actions, and their speech, in moments of hot discussion over the allotment of the choicer teeth, was truly a gabble. They spoke in monosyllables and short, jerky sentences that was more a gibberish than a language. And yet, through it, ran hints of grammatical construction, and appeared vestiges of the conjugation of some superior culture. Even the speech of Granser was so corrupt that were it put down literally, it would be almost so much nonsense to the reader. This, however, was when he talked with the boys. When he got into the full swing of babbling to himself, it slowly purged itself in the pure English. The sentences grew longer, and were enunciated with a rhythm and ease that was reminiscent of the lecture platform. "'Tell us about the Red Death, Grancer,' Harelip demanded, when the teeth affair had been satisfactorily concluded. "'The Scarlet Death,' Edwin corrected. "'And don't work all that funny lingo on us,' Harelip went on. "'Talk sensible, Grancer, like a Santa Rosan ought to talk. Other Santa Rosans don't talk like you.'" End of Section 1 Recording by James Christopher, jxchristopher at yahoo.com